I am sure that this message is going to matter for you. We were talking in our series on Proverbs about what wisdom looks like and how to pursue it and how to find it and how really the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. And this weekend we are talking about one of the most obvious ways in which wisdom is expressed. I want to read a verse that's not even on your outline. It's Colossians 4, 6. It says, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. In my opinion, that's one of the best descriptions in the New Testament of how wisdom looks in a life. That your conversation is full of the grace of God and it's seasoned with salt, which means, you know, too much salt, oh, wow, hate that. Too little salt, bland. So just the right amount, flavored. Uh, remember we talked last week about that the, the mouth of the wise makes knowledge acceptable. So then he, then he says this kicker, so that you may know how to answer everyone. To know how and when to say certain things to certain people and when not to say things. That is an incredible application of wisdom. So we're going to dig into the book of Proverbs and we're going to look at what is the Proverbs and it is full of discussion of what a wise person's tongue, what a wise person's mouth, what a wise person's heart is like. And so let me give you an illustration that may be helpful. We are looking at a little tree here that maybe you could see would be in your corner of your room and pretend this is a tree that you actually are hoping to get some fruit from. And, and uh, this is an illustration I heard about a healthy church, but I think it really works in terms of our conversation. And that is the tree's looking a little limp, it's, the leaves are getting a little yellowed, it's maybe a little brown around the corners and you think something's wrong here. And so you don't really know what to do, you're giving it water and air and light, so it must be the fertilizers. And so you put on some nitrogen and boy, it greens up and things look better and you think, oh, this is great. I'm just going to keep doing this. And so you, you keep putting nitrogen on and you keep putting nitrogen on and, and pretty quick it starts burning up the plant and you never get any fruit because what actually you needed was some phosphorus or some potash and it needed other minerals and other things in the soil. And you know to keep a, a plant healthy, you're not going to put toxic waste in there or throw your garbage there, but you're going to nurture it, but to nurture it, you have to know what the plant needs. And so I'm going to use that picture with the words that come out of our mouths. The proverb says that the words of a wise man nurture. They bring life to the people that are around them. And so I really want you, as we listen to this message together, I want you to do some heart evaluation. My goal for us is that we would become hyper aware of the words that come out of our mouths and that we would let that be a, a way in which we diagnose and see our own hearts more clearly and then allow God to heal us and to change us so that the words coming out of our mouths nurture the people that are around us, whether they're family or schoolmates or friends or, or strangers. And so we're going to dive right into the book of Proverbs with one of the key verses it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. The, the key word there is all. All of your ways, we acknowledge the Lord. We submit, submit to him. We surrender our lives. You can't do when you're on duty, when you're at church, when you're on your best behavior, you see, the words that come out of your mouth are there all the time. And he says, in all things, which means your words and your language and your conversation. And then it says, if you submit those to him, he will make your path straight, which is just what I was saying. Our words diagnose our heart, which we surrender to God. And then he makes us, first of all, to be able to walk straight. And then he goes ahead and behind of it. So last week, Pastor Jason talked about three things that a wise person is conscious or aware of. And the first was our influences, the influences that other things have on us and the influence we have on others. And the second 
We talked about our tongue and how we speak, and I'm going to talk about how we listen. And then thirdly, on our heart. And so I'm going to, I'm going to start with the last one of those because clearly, if we are going to have good conversation, we need to understand not only that words matter, but that it comes from our heart. The Old Testament, sometimes we look at as being maybe out of date or maybe even not as relevant or maybe even doesn't focus on the gospel like Jesus did. And I want to show you that the Jewish wisdom that Jesus grew up with, that in fact Jesus is the personification of wisdom. And so when we look at the New Testament, we're seeing Jesus live out all of these Proverbs. So the importance goes into, first of all, Jesus said, the words that you speak, they reveal what is in your heart. They are one of the most important diagnostic tools. So think about this carefully. Think about the words you said all last week. Those talk about, those describe, those diagnose the brokenness and the sin and the neediness as well as the wonderful grace of God in our lives, that our words are an evidence of what goes on inside of our hearts. Jesus said it this way, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. So if you've got a lot of great things in there, they just bubble out. Likewise, an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. And here's the line, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. He said, it works that when, you're, when, you're, when your heart overflows, it just comes out your mouth. So, so let me challenge you with this. People don't make you swear, even if they're crazy drivers. People don't make you gossip. People don't make you lie. People don't make you criticize. People don't make you complain. People don't make you cut others down. That's coming out of your heart. Yeah, the circumstance, the trigger, the, the opportunity came up from something else. But when the cup gets poured over, when the cup gets knocked over, what's inside the cup comes out. And so it's, we're talking about more than just keep a muzzle. Don't say those things. We're saying, listen to what does come out and then ask God to help you deal with the root of that. Why is that coming out? Why is that a part of of what is going on inside of me. So words reveal the heart. And then he goes on and he says the second part of it, which is also interesting. It says that words pollute the heart. Now, how does that work? Let me, let me just describe this. To hate somebody, that's an awful thing. That's sin, that's in your heart, that's, that's wrong. When you speak hateful words, or as Pastor Jason mentioned last week, when you type hateful words on your accounts on, on Facebook or on, on whatever, whatever media platform you're using, those do incredible damage. They damage the people that listen to them. They also somehow pollute your reputation and your life. And, and in fact, the words that you speak out loud make a mark on you and on others. It, it's, it's sin probably to think those terrible things about somebody else, but it's even worse when you gossip. So Jesus is talking to a Jewish culture where they were focused on external righteousness. It was what you did that people saw and you washed your hands carefully before you ate and you could only eat the kosher foods and not the wrong things. And, and they were teaching that the idea of, of really of holiness and of righteousness is how you behave on the outside. We call it behavior modification, or what I'll tell you is if you're behaving on the outside and your heart isn't changed, that's just hypocrisy. You're just pretending, and, and we can all pretend in certain places at certain times with certain people for a short time. But Jesus says, your heart is revealed by your words, but it also pollutes and continues to uh, infect you as you speak those things. So in chapter 15 of John, he says, what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. The food's not the problem. What comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. And so Jesus lays a foundation for why we understand that these Proverbs that he probably grew up with are really important for us to listen and to learn. And, and I'm going to share with you quite a few Proverbs. We'll go quickly. I hope you can take a few notes on them. But what I really want you to do is to go back in your own Bible. And, and honestly, this is how I, I got to this, this message. 
was I went through my Bible and, and the Proverbs that talked about our words and our tongue and our speech, I wrote with a T for tongue. And, and what I began noticing as I was marching through all of the T's, and there's a 43 of them, is that there's a lot of L's also. That listening is a vital part. When we talk about conversation, it is talking and listening. In fact, I should say that in reverse order. It's listening and then talking. So I want us to, as we look at Proverbs, to first of all underscore the importance of listening. In fact, the, the proverb that I like that from chapter 18 says, fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. Man, I was going to say that's what you see in our culture all over the place right now, but I'd have to tell you that that's also what I see in myself, that it's nice to be right, and it's nice to have the right opinion, and, and, and you want to, to convince other people of your research and of your, your understanding and of your knowledge, of my knowledge. But he says, a fool finds no pleasure in understanding, which means a wise person finds great pleasure in understanding. And that, that makes listening and asking good questions and drawing people out far, far, far more important than straightening them out with your opinion. So he says, fools find no pleasure in understanding. You know why? Because for a fool, it's all about me. And, and I honestly, when, when I am in the spirit and God's at work in me, I enjoy asking questions and finding out about people that are different from me. And, and seeing even why they have a point of view that's different than mine or, or why something bothers them when I think it's ridiculous or, or why something doesn't bother them when I think it's very important. And when the Spirit is filling me, I find that is a wonderful channel to get to know people and it builds a relationship. And Pastor Jason last week said that relationships are the bridge for the gospel. They're the bridge for gospel transformation at every stage. So when God's at work in me, I enjoy that and I practice that. When I am in the flesh and I am being Paul, and I love to listen to you with my answer running. You see, this, this is a part of our difficulty is that naturally most of us are not very good listeners. And the, the proverb says, there's another proverb that says, he who, the, the one who answers before listening the same as is to his shame and folly. And my problem is that I have a tendency to listen with my answer running. I don't know if you can relate to that, but I'm a fast processor and somebody starts talking to me, especially my wife. I already think, I already know what she's going to say. I've heard this before. I already know where you're going to go. And I am immediately sitting there like waiting for her to get done so that I can say whatever. Sometimes I agree. Sometimes I disagree. Sometimes I want to you know, up the story or whatever. But I'm not listening. I'm not really understanding. I'm not really getting it. And so one of the uh, things that we are going to walk away with is uh, realize that the important part of conversation is to seek first to understand. That my priority should be, do I understand the person I'm talking to, the conversation, that the goal of listening is to understand, not to just respond. And on our, our experience with marriage team, uh, marriage coaching, uh, I've had the privilege to be coached and or, or to do the coaching training and then to coach some others. And one of the things we work through very, very carefully is how to speak so that you can be heard. And we talk through I statements. And then how to do active listening. And active listening is a very... Uh, strategic process. So the speaker lines up and we say, okay, you've got some emotions about this. You, you are struggling with something. You have something hard to communicate. You want to say, you're the speaker. Your job is to listen. It's not to agree. It's not to rebuke. It's not to rebuke. It's to understand. And so the, the speaker does an I statement with I feel when this situation is like this, because, and here's some of the deeper reasons under it. So, I feel when, because, and then they make their statement. And the goal, the job of the listener 
is to say what I heard you say. And then you repeat back, not verbatim, but with different words to try to say, I understand what you're saying. And here's the key part of it. And then they're required to say, did I get it? Wow. Would that change our conversations? If we said to somebody, here's what I hear you say, did I get it right? Because the honest answer in a lot of cases is that the speaker will say mostly or partly or almost. 80% listening isn't good. So we'll back up and try it again. So try to speak again as the speaker and emphasize maybe the part he didn't get or the part she didn't get a little more. And then the person tries to, the listener tries to respond and, and answer that. Um, here's what I heard you say. And did I, did I get it? And until the speaker says, yes, you got it, we have not fully understood. Now, part of our problem, part of my problem is, I feel like if I understand, then I have to, it's like I tacitly agree with it. And sometimes I don't agree. But how foolish to disagree before you really understand. And that's where I get into big trouble. Maybe you do too. So, seek first in a conversation to understand who that other person is, where they're coming from, what's going on, what they would like to say. If that is the first goal in your conversation, it's going to change your life. Now, sometimes we think of being wise with our words means just being quiet. And there's a, actually a funny proverb about that. It says, even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. There, there's a modern proverb kind of built off that that says, better to be silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. We're not talking about how you can be silent because when you are silent, you are communicating all kinds of things that you don't even know. What we're talking about is listening well, active listening. And so you listen to people you're listening to, your conversation to everybody you're listening to, but particularly wise people listen to advice and accept discipline. And at the end, you will be counted among the wise. When I think of verses like that, when I think of Proverbs, boy, there's a lot of verses about the dad talking to his son about, my son, simple one, get this. And, and he's really trying to educate him kind of at the beginning of the, of the journey of life. And it is easy for 16 to 20 year olds to think they've already got the, the world figured out and they don't need to listen. And we know that that's probably not true. But let me tell you, friends, it can come with 60s and 70s and 80 year olds too. In fact, I think it's easy for us, especially if you've been with the Lord a long time and been in the church a long time, it's, it's easy to begin to pretend that we've arrived, that we don't need other people to give us advice, that, that I've got it fine, I, I've made up my mind, I've already decided on that, I'm done. And the characteristic of a wise person is they keep on learning. There is so much to continually learn. And, and honestly, some of the things that I'd learned in the past are wrong and I need to adjust and, and see them more clearly. So a wise person keeps on being wiser because they keep on listening and asking advice. And the, the second part of learning to be a good listener is to ask good questions. So the, another proverb I like, it says, the, the purposes of a man's heart are deep well and a person of understanding will draw them out. What a great picture for a conversation is, I'm trying to find out what makes you tick, what's going on underneath, how to really care for you. And you may not be good at this. Most people are not really good at asking questions that prompt a conversation. A conversation is like a tennis game. If you, if you just are serving all the time, it's no fun being on the other side of the net. You serve, and then you volley back and forth, and then you let them serve. And maybe they don't serve well, so you ask them a question. You get to draw them out. And that's part of being a wise person, is to learn to draw people out. Um, my daughters, when they were at home and used to occasionally go on coffee dates, they were just kind of checking a guy out, and they didn't really want to go on a dinner date. That was too much of a commitment. And so it was a, it was a learning curve for me to listen to them come home and talk with their sisters about this guy they dated. And uh, it, was a, it was a picture into the, the girl's world. And 
I, I remember one time Jody came back and she was talking about a two-hour coffee date she had with somebody. And, and in incredulity, she said, he only asked me two questions. And I thought, I did not know that guys were rated on a date by how many questions they asked. And what happened is Jody's really good at asking questions and she drew, she drew him out and of course he's going on and he's talking about his favorite subject himself and he's telling all that he knows about himself and he goes and goes and goes and goes and never or rarely reaches across and say, what about you? Tell me about you. You see, here, here's one of the things you need to understand. One of the best ways to love somebody is to listen to them well. So if we're not good listeners, that means we are not very good at loving people. So asking good questions and follow-up questions and did I hear you say this and wow, how did that feel and what was going on to make that happen and that's interesting. I've never heard that before. Where'd you get that? And you can, you can have a, a few stock questions that work in almost any situation. So seek first to understand if you want to be wise. Learn to ask good questions to draw the other person out and then listen carefully instead of listening to the story that's already in your head. Here's a proverb about that. In a lawsuit, the first to speak seems right until someone comes forward and cross-examines. Now, we talked about that in the first week, that a fool listens to the first person that gets to him, and then they just believe that. Let me, let me tell you, it's a little even different than that. You and I have a tendency to prejudge people right off, especially... We form opinions when you've already heard something about them in the rumor mill or their reputation or somebody told you something about what they said or what they did. And I'll tell you, if you've already decided that somebody is really stuck on themselves or if somebody's not to be trusted or whatever you've heard about them, if you've already decided that before you listen to them, you will find evidence that that's true. You see, listening means we need to leave, really give people a chance. We need to get a chance to, to hear them with an open mind and really see who they are instead of what we've heard about them. So, good listening precedes good talking. But the next part is obviously really important, is we need to listen around the bias that we've heard about somebody, about what's gone on beforehand, about what happened 10 years ago. But then we also need to use right words in our response. Being a wise person doesn't mean always being silent. Sometimes silence is golden. Sometimes it's just plain yellow. It's fearful. I, I don't know what to say, so I'll say nothing. And so we need to learn how to speak well. There's 18 verses in Proverbs on listening well. There's 43 on speaking well. And Proverbs 12 says this, From the fruit of their lips, people are filled with good things, and the work of their hands brings them reward. I really think it's just saying literally, your words will provide a life for you just as much as your hands will provide a living for you. I've, I've tried to say this to young people as they're training for their whatever, whatever uh, major or whatever career they're going into. I've said, work on your people skills, on your listening and talking and how you relate to people because in almost every vocation, your people skills will determine your success more than your technical skills. In, in a few very, you know, esoteric like engineering or software writing, maybe, maybe your technical skills are all you need. But for most of the things, how you relate to people in the groups will be by far determine how far up you go in your career. And you know what we work on? We work on the technical skills and not on how do I learn to speak to everyone as they need at that moment. So from the fruit of their lips... Your life goes forth. And in fact, I'd like to talk a little bit about what Proverbs says about life-giving words. My, my dad had a big thing about a number one son, and I'm the oldest of five. And my dad had confidence in me before I even knew that was, a, that was an important thing. And I, I had conflict with my dad a lot when I was in later high school. Not a lot, but we definitely differed. And I, I didn't want to be like my dad. I wanted to be like my mom because she had, I, I was more like her in some ways and she had so many obvious gifts that I, I wanted to, to be the pattern of my life. And as I, I got older, uh, in fact, it was in my early 20s that I was writing a Father's Day card to my dad 
And I, and I was thinking through, I want to say thank you to the gifts that my dad gave me. And I was thinking through and I remembered that, that dad always said, Paul, you can do this. He said to other people, well, let Paul do it. He'll take care of it. And the downside of that is he told me I'm the responsible one because the lead dog sets the path and your brothers and sister are going to follow you and it's all on you. But the, but the upside of that is that he had an incredible confidence that <laughs> was not really warranted. And because of that, I realized as an adult, I, I'm not afraid to try things. I don't mind jumping in. Failure doesn't seem so scary. Uh, I think it'll probably work out. And I looked back and I thought, where did I get that? I got that from the life-giving words of my dad who said, you can do this. I, I know, you'll be all right. You'll do well. And that was a, all the way through. That was the kind of fertilizer, nutrients that was going into my soil all of my growing up years. And that was such a valuable part. What, what are some of those valuable words that we need to learn to speak? Well, Proverbs has a cool picture. It says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. It's like a beautiful piece of jewelry that's valuable and precious. That the right word at the right time, which is what we started talking about. So what are some of those right words? Well, you can try to write this down on the right side of your sheet, but truth. And I don't just mean telling people the truth about themselves. I mean open and honest, vulnerable truth about yourself. That's life-giving. Proverbs 15.1 says, a soft answer turns away wrath. Being able to answer somebody softly who's anxious or upset or, or critical of you. Man, when somebody says something harsh to you, your next second is so important. You know, there's between when something happens and when you respond, there's a tiny little bit of space. And we need to widen that space out and to think about how do I need to respond? How do I give a soft answer? Words of encouragement. Words that say, man, you're doing a great job or boy, this matters or are you okay? Those are so life-giving. On our staff, we talk about I see in you words, which is what Jason said last week when, when Brent said to him, I think you are good at this teaching thing. I, I think you ought to pursue that. I like to see what you're doing. It's going to get better. Good questions, as I mentioned already. The drawing out of other people. Learning to speak a question. In fact, my challenge for you is, next time you're in a conversation, try to monitor in your head, am I asking more questions or am I just talking? And if you are not good at asking questions, make yourself ask two good questions for everything that you share about yourself or about your opinion. And then godly advice, all through Proverbs, it talks about the wise like to give their wisdom. They make knowledge acceptable. They try to find avenues in which we, what, what I've learned can become a benefit for somebody else. So, so pause just a moment and think about your last week. Of all the words that you said, of all the conversations at work, at school, at home, especially at home, how much of that was open, vulnerable truth, was a soft answer when there was a wrath. In fact, the other part of that verse says, but harsh words stir up a quarrel. Were you, are you an encourager? Do you nurture the people around you? Do you see positive vision for them? Do you, do you ask good questions to draw them out? What, what are the words that come out of your mouth? See, that's the condition of your heart. And that's what we need to surrender to God so that in all of our ways, we are honoring him. Because you see, good speech and good listening, all those are great techniques for relationship. But the deeper part of this, remember the, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. The, the deeper part of this is, number one, I want my words to be pleasing to God. God's listening. God, God cares about how we speak. Jesus said we're going to be judged for every idle word. Man, that's a high bar. So God cares about it. And the other part of it is what Jason said last week is that building relationships with people through our words gives an opportunity for the gospel to go out. And not only to unbelievers, but the gospel transformation to other believers. To be iron sharpening iron. So there are life-giving words and of course they're the opposite. There are life-taking words. Last week, 
Jason read the verse that says that the tongue has the power of life and death. And you are contributing either, every time you speak, you're contributing to life-giving or life-taking. Just a little bit of draining from them. And Proverbs warns about that. He says, those who guard their mouths and their tongues keep themselves from calamity. Man, be so careful what comes out. And, and there's several kinds of words that are warned against in the Proverbs. He talks about lying and what happens with lies and how that destroys lives. He talks about quarrelsome words, arguing and trying to convince everybody of your opinion. He talks about bragging. Proverbs 27 says, let another praise you and not your own mouth. You don't have to tell people how good you are. If you're really are good, somebody else will say it. Gossip. Gossip, speaking negatively about somebody who's not in the room in a way that would dishonor them if they were in the room. So easy. One of the funny things about gossip is that everybody agrees that it's bad and everybody does it. I mean everybody. Harsh words stir up quarrels. Rash words. Rash words means I haven't thought about it. I haven't processed it. I haven't thought it through. It just bleh, out it comes. Let me tell you, between whatever happens, your thought in your head and the words that come out of your mouth, if you don't have any space there, that's rash. He says, give it a little space. Have there room for, for your, your, your speech to be full of grace, seasoned with salt. And then you'll know how to answer everyone. So he wants us to have good listening skills. God wants us to have good speaking skills. Not only because it's an evidence of how he needs to change our heart or how he has, but it's because it will benefit everybody around. So our memory verse this week is a very simple one. The lips of the righteous nourish many. Fools die for lack of sense. When you're around somebody, think about that. Are the words that I'm speaking, are they causing life and encouragement and growth? Is this the right amount of nutrients or, or air or water? Am I, am I coming around this person so that they are built up and encouraged and that they're getting life out of this? Or am I just draining the life out of them so I can get life for myself? It says, fools die for lack of sense. And we've been challenging you to, to memorize scripture and to put it into your, your heart so that it begins to impact your thinking. And so in that little space between somebody's harsh word if you can remember, a gentle answer turns aside wrath. Boy, that'll help you respond differently. That happened to me this week. I, <laughs> somebody said something strongly to me and I was like, oh, if I'm preaching on words, why wouldn't I think I'm getting tested? And I was silent. Sometimes that's the best you can do. I didn't say the wrong thing. Hopefully you get to say the right thing, the soft answer. I'm going to hand off to our campus pastors and they're going to try to drill down a little bit more with helping us walk out this week with a hyper-awareness on our words and on our heart and on what God wants to do. So thank you for listening to us. God bless.